Right, this is a 3000 podcast. My name is Maloney. I'm joined today by an old mate and a renowned artist of Melbourne. Are you an artist? <laughs> I hope so. Mickey G. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Mick, all the way down from the surf coast. I appreciate you making the trek in the traffic, man. Thanks for coming. Oh, good, man. Pleasure to be here. Good to <laughs> when, see you, man. <laughs> yeah, you too. It's been a while. It's yeah, been a while. Yeah. Um, and when I had a list of people that I wanted to get on that had stories I know to tell about Melbourne, you were one of the first people on the list, and I actually thought that you might not be into it, so I'm fucking really stoked that you've come here. <laughs> so thanks for that to start with, man. Um, so what we usually do is we start where you grow up, where you grew up, and I think you grew up in Port Melbourne. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. We've had a couple of people that I've spoken to from Port. Uh, it's a different sort of place there now than when we grew up. For sure. But growing up there, where I was until I was 13, there wasn't a lot to fucking do, was there? Um, I mean, look, looking back on it, that was probably the beauty of it. Well, you say not a lot to do. There was not a lot there. But like as a kid, man, it was all industrial and stuff like that. So, you know, there was lots to lots of mischief to get into you know what I mean? we didn't have a skate park but there was a few makeshift skate parks For and that sure. sort of thing yep so kids don't know how easy they've got it man they've got a skate park in every little city now and every little town oh, for sure i was just talking about this with someone else just saying like we begged the councils back then to like I remember, build yeah. something you know petition after petition and you know so disheartening now like you say every suburb's got a skate park and even afterwards i remember we were, i was like probably in high school when they built that one under graham street it's still a bit of a prefab job anyway and that took like 30 years yeah. now they're just plonking skate parks that no one even asks for for sure yeah. just in areas but i guess it's good for the kids yeah i can't sure. hate on that sort of stuff <laughs> it's all good eh? so you grow up in in uh, port melbourne and then when at what stage of your life do you discover art or that that's something that you're really passionate about and what you want to kind of do um man i guess i always drew like as a kid like uh, it was um even in primary school you know um as early back as i can remember just doodling and being able to draw and like uh wanting to get better at drawing it was in primary school i think it was me and a mate bart who was like you know we would probably push each other you know um and like it was, yeah, that was that was cool having that sort of rivalry almost. Or so you're rivalry. doing characters and like copying cartoon characters and that sort of thing, or you drink, you're just drawing whatever your your mind. Whatever, imagining. yeah, just anything. Uh, and like, in just in school, like you'd have to like redraw, like a uh, book cover and stuff like that. You know, I can remember sort of doing something as early as that. You know, where you try and replicate a, a book cover and things like that. You know, and it just made sense to you quicker than some kids where you thought oh, I can understand how this works. Like I know drawing isn't natural for a lot of people. For sure, and like the more I've sort of looked into it, um. Yeah, your left side of your brain, right side of your brain. Like, you know, it's uh, anyone can draw. It's just like whether you, you know, you you venture down that right side of your brain more than someone else who's like more, you know, analytical or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's, totally. It's, it's the creative side. For sure. So you've discovered drawing, you're in primary school. When do you sort of discover the hip hop culture or what, you know, is like we, we call graffiti, but, you know, when did you decide, discover that other side of things that is kind of a little bit edgier than just drawing on a piece of paper? Um, hip hop man, like, I think Beat Street was probably the first first movie that sort of like people, you know yep. caught my attention and just saw it and it was just yes, yeah, it's it amazing. Um, and hip hop was so big back then. I think first album I bought on on cassette was like um, uh, maybe like Rocksteady Crew or something like that. You yeah, know? I remember having like a fucking sailor hat and all this sort of stuff <laughs> and doing like moonwalks and shit. I think they got some fucking funny photos of me doing some stuff like that, man. Um, I don't know. And then just, just trying to do graffiti. I remember obviously you start on paper and stuff like that and then, you know, just progress from there. I think I did my first piece on a wall at maybe 12 or 13. Yep. Somewhere local, like Station Pier or somewhere that was like... Uh, I was like behind Molly Blooms, like down this laneway. It was like... Man, I remember you had a piece there even later. Like... Yeah, there same, was one, same spot. Same that spot. Was probably With the, the rhino, was it? Uh, yeah, it was rhino, rhino there. Rhino, yeah. A few sort of 3D pieces back there and then... Yeah, that, that's what I got a few different pieces over the years. Because it was kind of, it was hidden enough away that you could sort of, you know. Yeah, it was like illegal without being illegal. Cool. Like no one's going to hassle you out being there, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you start painting around about, around Port Melbourne, around this sort of local area. Mm -hmm. One thing I often think about with where we kind of grew up, and one thing that's pretty instrumental to graffiti is you represent your line. 
Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> we didn't have one. So that's so you know what I mean? Like not the uh, yeah, okay. So we had a, a light oh, we, rail. We used to, man. We back in yeah, I'd say that when I was real little, that was a train. I can, and it was I'm looking, old enough to remember actually going on that train with my mum one really? time, man. The yeah. old red rattlers. And now uh, I don't even know what it would have been back then. I just remember like I remember the, the train, bridge that went over. Train, yeah. And you could ride your bike down the bridge and then like yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I remember the bridge, but we yeah, look, we we had a tram line. Yep. And then I guess anyone from around here kind of sided with the Sandy Line. Did you feel a little bit of a connection to the Sandy Line? For sure, you know, like going to school at like C- uh, CBC for for a year there and that sort of stuff. And it was, yeah, that, that would be our line, you know. That's definitely the line there. Balaclava that, and that sort of stuff going down there. You know, the Little Hustlers as well, where yeah. everyone used to hang out at Bella Station. <laughs> for sure. You believe it or not, Little Hustlers now is like a where you buy thirteen dollar yogurt. Really? Yeah, it's like a Yochi. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> it's come a long way from selling For single sure. cigarettes. So, um, yeah, so that that's the line that you, I guess you sort of sided with because it must have been hard when you're going out trying to sort of do your thing and people sort of saying, oh, where are you from? And you sort of say, well, well, this is where we're from. We don't have a line. Did you find that it to be um, not not a problem, but, you know, somewhat of a you know, I guess we didn't have that pride. Like, you know, like Hursty's got the Hursty pride and whatever, you know, like Frankston and all that sort of stuff. Each Puff and Billy, you know, all the Dandong boys, they've all kind of got a line. But, I mean, I think Port Melbourne's got enough of its own cred that we didn't sort of need a line, mate. That's <laughs> very yeah. true. You know, Port Melbourne speaks for itself, I guess, or at least it used to, you know, back yep. in the day. Yep, and South Melbourne, where we are now, there was a lot of industrial space around here. Yeah. Pieces everywhere. Now there's huge legals. I don't know if you had a look next door. There's like a seven-foot legal there. Yeah, right. Have a look when you go nice, out. Okay. Um, but, yeah, there was a lot of lot of space to play around here and that sort of thing. But I guess Paran, sort of Windsor, Bella, all the people from this area sort of used to congregate around there a little sure. bit. Yeah. And that's probably, I'm guessing, where you found a lot more like-minded people because not to say there wasn't a little tiny mini scene around Port Melbourne, but I guess you kind of needed to venture out maybe to somewhere like Obese or somewhere like that to sort of meet other people that were like-minded. Is that right? Yeah, it was funny. Like when I was, I don't know, when I was real little, little oh, hell, probably like from grade four till about year... <laughs> I don't know, year eight or nine or something like that, you know what I mean? Like, um, I was probably always a bit younger than a lot of the crew I hang around with in Port Melbourne. They'd sort of take me under their wing and that sort of stuff. And, like, um, growing up in the 80s, all those dudes were older, so they were, like, riding, doing panels and stuff like that, and I was probably too late. I mean, too too young to, like, be allowed out late to do panels and stuff <laughs> like that. I mean, I was just this little kid, man. Had some pretty strict parents too, man. Um, But so, like, you know, graph was huge back then. Yeah. And, um. All the dudes in my flats where I grew up, you know, we all used to write and stuff like that and all a bit older, but just more like bombing and stuff, not really panels or paintings and that sort of um, pieces back then, you know. But um, I don't know where I was going with this. But, no, um, that's all, but I was just sort of talking about where you would meet like yeah, but then people. Yeah, going to school, I guess you'd have to go home through Flinders Street and that sort of stuff and like everyone at your high school, sort of like there was like a little pocket of writers there and that sort of stuff and... um. You know, yeah, and definitely Pram was like a mecca, probably mm. still is to some degree, you know, for, for graffiti. It definitely is there. And like, I guess hanging out at Pram Bowl back then, which wasn't a skate yeah. park like it is now, it just yeah. had that vert ramp and then that small bowl. bowl. Yeah. And that was a bit of a hangout. And I guess yeah. skate parks have always been, I guess, like you were saying before, almost like a legal spot that isn't really a legal spot. For sure, yeah. So you can try out your wares and that sort of thing. Yeah. Did you spend a bit of time at OB? So there was a few sort of like little hangouts back then. Um, I look, I, I sort of grew up a lot in... I spent my weekends in Pran. Like, my mum had a sewing business in Windsor. So, like, you know, all weekend, man, she'd be there working. So, I'd just go along. I'd go to work with her. I'd disappear for the day. When she was ready to go home, man, I'd go home. So, I was, like, just at Pran Bowl all weekends, you know, pretty yeah. much every weekend. Um, I- yeah, and just meet new crew, skate and graph go hand in hand, you know. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And it, it's interesting now, like, you go to that same sort of place and there's the same sort of kids, obviously, where I'm older, but they're, they're still there wearing similar clothes. You know, that 90s yeah. resurgence has come back in. For sure. People are wearing baggy pants again, yeah, yeah. blank hoodies, all that sort of yeah, stuff. It's yeah. cool to see all that come full circle. Oh, for sure. I think for some people, it never really left. You know, I'm, well, probably, that's I'm probably stuck in that era. If you like, don't yeah. change your dress sense, then you'll be cool in 20 years. It's easy. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um. So... You started a crew or you 
did you start a crew or did you fall into a crew or how did that how did the because in graffiti it is a solo sport but you also have to sort of represent a team as well for sure um so port melbourne the crew back then was sdm you know um and that was our crew when we were riding back then and obviously everyone sort of you know what i mean it sort of fell out of fashion or whatever people sort of a lot of people stopped riding and then like so that sort of fell by the wayside a lot of those like I mentioned, they were older than me, so they sort of got out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, they sort of lost interest, and then um, you thought you'd carry the torch on. Oh yeah, that back when I sort of started riding in maybe like '98, '99, sort of, I sort of started getting back into it like properly again. And then um, I thought, oh, what am I gonna do? I'm like, I'll start up SDM again. You know, just keep keep that rather than start a new crew. I'm like, well, I'm just gonna you know continue on with where we left off yeah for sure and then you definitely recruited some people with i'd say different sort of styles and that was kind of really cool man like you know you could see a production or you know i was uh, lucky enough to be there and and, um you know witness some of these things but everyone had their own style yeah and it didn't look like one long homogenized thing yeah you could tell who was doing what and that i think that really made it fucking interesting yeah and probably helped you guys be a bit more prolific as a crew because people are like, well, they all do different things. True, yeah. Was that by design or just sort of fucking happened like that? It sort of happened. I started riding, like I said, and then um, Perry, you probably remember Perry, yeah, um, he yeah. got me in touch with um, Discreet yep. and I uh, said, oh, this dude's like keen to, he's got no one to paint with. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, put us together. Then he put us together and we started like painting together. You know, I don't know how we picked up um, his trim. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's, yeah, it was just funny, man. Yeah. You know, he sort of started painting with us and, like you said, everyone's style was different. It was like so different as well. You know what I mean? Like he was. Um, so he know. was, but he was. I remember back in the day, he was doing like mixing letters up and doing things upside down and back to front and all that For sort sure, of thing. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Which yeah. and a lot of that stuff, and also with discreet, you mentioned those guys were a little bit ahead of their time with the style that they were doing, which now people call like anti style yeah. or there's yeah or ghetto style or whatever. But yeah. I feel like those guys obviously were pretty well versed in how graffiti works and yep. they were sort of stripping it back and i don't think there's too many other people doing that like back then there was a few yeah it's funny i guess like some dudes who come almost full circle like you've pushed something to the limit where you can and then you're like oh, i'm kind of either bored of this or i'm just it's not like fun or challenging anymore so i'm going to sort of regress my style and yeah. you know that's like um a challenge in itself you know yeah well it's sort of like what a lot of great artists do like i mean like fine artists like you know picasso yeah. and that sort of thing they get bored of doing yeah, yeah. photo realism and they go sure. they go through a new period yeah, so i guess it, it makes sense yeah but you've got to understand the rules to sort of break them though so i For think sure, yeah if you go out there your first piece is going to be anti-style that's not anti-style you're just being a toy is that sort of like- <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think that's a general consensus out there at the moment man yeah yeah you think you're not liking what you're seeing at the moment uh, like you said, like I think you have to master something before you can then go and, you know, break all the rules, I think. You know what I mean? You have to show that you're capable of doing something before you yeah. just like say, oh, I don't give a shit about the rules, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's a cop out where you're just like, yeah, uh, uh, I'm trying to be as toy as I can, you know? Yeah, and like you could do that, but if you're going to go out, this is the thing about graffiti that I guess is different to any other art form. You're putting yourself right out there to cop shit from everybody in every direction and sure. you're doing it illegally so if no one likes it then it's not going to last sure. so you can do whatever you want in your little black book but I guess if you're going to put it out there you've got to be ready for people to uh, tell you what they think yeah I mean that's that's the sort of school that I come from you know what I mean but um, I think like you see it everywhere these days like there's no rules and people are breaking rules and even like in a tattoo game you know like um people come in and they want their tattoos to look like they've been done with your left hand fucking in prison and that sort of stuff really you know? that's, that's a whole that's a style these days you know like i've noticed that look yeah i i want to talk about all the tattooing stuff but yeah. just quickly um yeah. yeah i've noticed that the whole prison thing is definitely a thing yeah. but i didn't realize they wanted them to look that shit i thought that they were just going through that whole black really solid you know yeah i mean there's dudes who do black work do it well and then there's people who just want something that looks like it's been scratched in you know really and yeah and that's a trend that surely can't last forever i mean i think people look back on it and they'll be able to pick the area that it was in and mm. you know get it covered up you know, <laughs> or removed um i think anyway yeah so all right well we'll come back to the graffiti stuff we'll talk we've, we've started on the tattoo thing so we'll talk about some tattoo stuff cool. um i guess like any artist you need to find 
a way to monetize your art eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only so many ways people can sell canvases and do that sort of thing from the graffiti thing. And you got into tattooing, which I think now a lot of graffiti artists are getting into tattooing. But when you were doing that, what, like 15 years ago? Yep. Um, that probably wasn't a, a, such a popular route. Um, and you did it and you did it the old fashioned way. You did like the apprenticeship and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And so that now, do you find that kids are jumping that sort of stage? They're just buying their machine and just saying, I'm a tattooist now? Um, yeah, for sure. I think I've, I've just scraped in where I've been tattooing long enough to have like caught the tail end of the old school where, um, you know, there was still yellow pages in phone books. And uh, I think there was like one person selling tattoo stuff in the phone book. And really? like, if you weren't a tattoo artist, mate, you weren't getting shit, you know? Really? Yeah. So now you can buy it on fucking Amazon and stuff, can't Amazon, you? Amazon, eBay, anywhere, man. Probably yet, uh, fucking whatever the other sites there are out there, man. And I'm sure, look, anyone who can draw can tattoo, but you're not learning the intricacies. You're not learning about, you know, you need to be, you know, understand how skin works. You need to understand about For all sure. that sort of I stuff. For sure. It's not quite that easy. That's what I thought getting into it. I thought, you know, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll have this mastered in a few weeks, man. It can't be that hard. You know? yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, uh, man, I was pretty wrong. You know what I mean? Like, there's so much to it, you know, like, um, just when you think you got to figure it out, you know, you t go to do the same thing on another person and their skin's totally different. different and yeah. like, you know, you think, what's going on, man? This was working a second ago. And then it's like, yeah, got to figure it out, you know? There's not too many different, like, mediums where the canvas is a human, you know? Yeah, so, like, so like you've always canvas, got different, you know? yeah, different canvas. For sure. You know, some people that are hairy, some people that aren't, all sorts of different And there's variables. different parts of the body. The skin's totally different, you know, super stretchy one spot, like, taut the other spot, you know? Mm different canvases <laughs> so then you did your apprenticeship and then you worked for a couple of tattoo shops and then you decided to open up your other your own shop that was a natural progression um yeah so apprenticeship in williamstown under kenny mac moving images uh moving pictures moving yeah. pictures yeah, yeah. where i got my first tattoo from you ah cool man that was a uh, 20 20 yeah. years yeah sick um yeah there and then then I caught wind that someone was opening up his shop in Port Melbourne and I was like, fuck, you know, they beat me to it, man. That was my sort of idea to do my apprenticeship and then like one day sort of open up the shop in your hometown where you grew up, you know. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, man, if I can't be the dude to do it, I'm going to join in, you know. Man, that was um, that was a cool shop. It was a bikey shop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. But it was it was a lot of fun in there, man, a lot of good people in there. Um, a lot of freedom, you know. The boss gave us a lot of a lot of freedom boss wasn't a tattooist he just sort of you know mm. ran, ran things yep and um so yeah it gave us a lot of freedom to be in there doing our thing you know and then you thought okay eventually i've got to open my own shop you open yeah. your own shop yeah i thought you know if the boss doesn't even tattoo and he's got a shop then i tattoo maybe i should like <laughs> i could do this you know what i mean yeah and, um i probably opened up a little bit prematurely but um you know i was kind of you get sick of paying 50% back then, you know, mm. uh, of your hard-earned dollars to, to you know, someone that was rarely there, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think where you did start your own thing was when tattoos really shot right into the mainstream. Like, they yeah. were sort of teetering on there. Yeah. But then it became hugely popular. And yeah. I guess they were popping up everywhere. So if there was a time to do it, that was the time to do For it. For sure, yeah. Yeah, so um, then I ended up opening up something with uh, Jeff, Oh um, yes, Jazzy Jeff, the Big Boys Club. The um, yep, I got a few tattoos there as well. Yeah, yeah the infamous uh, Big <laughs> Big Boys Club, man. That was that was a trip working there, man. It's like a, I don't know. Are we allowed to talk about this? Uh, here? Yeah, I guess so. It was like as much as it's as close as you're going to get to the Playboy Mansion in Melbourne. Is <laughs> something like that? Something yeah. like that. Yeah, but in a way with a with a tattoo shop <laughs> there, man. Yeah, it was. Um, that was cool. That was a cool, cool. Yeah, I, I, time man, I totally history. sort of blanked that part out because you did. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, because it didn't. That was that that whole warehouse didn't last that long. Probably warehouse lasted maybe three years, and I think I was there for maybe two of them. You know. Yeah. Um, oh, so you were there for a while. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So um, Jeff had that awesome space there, and um, it was just his business was primarily on or solely on the weekends, man, and this whole cool place was being unused during a week so yeah. i was like man why don't you just move in here and just tattoo here you know yeah, during a week sure. and i was like sounds like a win-win i get my weekends off i'm here don't have to do anything it's already set up like a nightclub in here you know yeah you're not answering to anybody yeah you know yeah. i can tattoo sip whiskey watch fucking 
Foxtel on a huge cinema, uh, you know, screen TV. It was it where I remember first time I went there, and I went there through you because you said I've got my space there, and I went there and yeah. I'm like, fuck man, what is this place? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah it's crazy. But it was um, a trip. Like it was just like an in industrial area. You think, fuck, I'm definitely in the wrong place, or I'm going to lose a kidney or something here, and then the doors would open up, and you're like, whoa, this is cool. You know? Yeah, man, that that part of town I think uh, is one of the. Uh, the Victoria Street just off there is probably one of the sketchiest parts of town. I th- I feel like I what, now even or? I think oh it's a little bit gentrified, but I don't know, man. Yeah. I wouldn't. It's it's pretty close to those flats there. You know what I mean? There's some that's sketchy where, flats, man. And no, and they've got the safe injecting room there yeah, as well. Yeah, like there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot going on there for sure. Um, so then you started you started your shop, and then you kind of decided I'm gonna start a second shop. Well, that was a partnership with Jeff and then like we were like um we're trying to do things legit went to the council and they're like look it's not designed correctly for a shop you know mm-hmm. um but if you're already doing it man we don't want to know about it you know well that's it they've got bigger problems around there for sure yeah and um <laughs> and so we looked for a space together and then um you know things didn't work out I guess um moving forward as I guess business partners and then um that's when I started Footscray um and that was a weird time because, like, even here, like, everyone was, like, bombing each other's shops so much that, like, you couldn't get insurance to get mm-hmm. a, be a tattooist or um, get a tattoo shop, you know? Like, yep. all the um, tattoo insurance people just pulled out of the industry totally. They didn't care if you were paying 30 grand a year, 50, man. They just weren't going to insure you as a tattoo shop. Yep. Um, so, that was a bit weird. I had to sort of... That's when I started uh, Crimson Art Collective. I just thought... Pivot a little bit? Yeah, don't put anything tattoo related in the name. Just do like a bit of a gallery, a bit something different and then like kind of tattoo sort of quietly, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, and then they, the laws, I mean, they um, they started insuring shops again soon after, so that was all right. But um, yeah, Footscray, there was no shops in Footscray at the time. Yeah, and I, it's funny, man, like being from Port Melbourne, people have seen it really gentrify. Mm. And for the last, like, 20 years, people have been saying, Footscray is going to be like Port Melbourne. And 20 years later, it's yeah. not like Port Melbourne. Like, it's gentrified <laughs> a bit. Do you know what I mean? It's not... It's yeah. You would have seen it, you know, yeah, come yeah, a, a sure. little bit... Yeah, but it still has its gritty sides. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's the beauty of it, man. It's like, it's got that. That's what I love about Footscray. It's, I mean, it's, it's mellow down heaps, you know? Yeah. I think when I first moved there and I was like just signed a lease and I was looking out the front on the street looking up where I'm going to be able to put a sign and some dude's there <laughs> looking at us and he goes what are you looking at he goes he goes dropping out of the sky <laughs> I mean mate Brad goes oh they will if you shoot him he goes oh yeah I'll fucking like to put a bullet in your head and fucking bullet in your head <laughs> yes, sir. Like, oh, welcome fuck. to the neighbourhood yeah fully man like yeah whatever but um we just had a laugh about it, man. Yeah, totally. So you, you're at Footscray. You've uh, you've opened your your shop, and then like I feel like at this point you decided you needed to get out of the city. Is that right? You've got a family. You wanted to maybe move down the coast. You got to. Um, yeah, yeah. Like uh, so, I started having kids, and they started going to. I think it wasn't when I started going to prep. You know, I mm. thought uh. Like we had mates down the coast, and we we'd visit them a lot. And then like I think one one time we visited them, maybe over Easter. It was like a school fete there or something. And I was looking around his primary school, looking at the artwork on the walls actually, and um, thought, fuck, this is a cool school, man. I want to send my kid to this school. You know, this looks like they're doing some good work here. And um, and then just made the decision like, all right, let's have a crack. You know, it's only an hour away. Yep. Worst case, if it doesn't work out, we just move back. Yeah. And um, end up just signing a lease like not even seeing it just on the internet you know yeah because it's so hard going down there to look at the joints and then like just apply for this place we get it we get it mm-hmm. and uh, got it man just moved never looked back never looked back <laughs> no well, that's it because you yeah. surf as well so obviously you're close to have yeah. like you know to surf beaches and that sort of thing and I think yeah. it's funny man because like when we we were grow up around here people say oh where are you from you're like oh we're from around here and they're yeah. like oh yeah right that's weird and you do love it but i guess everyone gets to the stage where you go oh, i'd be nice to have a backyard and nice to be, you know sure. have a bit of space yeah and it sucks for people like us i guess that grew up that you couldn't really afford a place in the area you grew up like it's yeah, basically yeah. like forget sure. about it yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't even afford a place in Torquay. <laughs> so I don't know where I'm going to live. I'll probably be a pikey in a fucking caravan somewhere. But it, but it's like a lot of people, I think, yeah, they can't afford to live where they... And For and sure. I, I really dig where I am down the other coast now on, on the peninsula. But um, 
if I thought I wanted to live, you know, in Port Melbourne, it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know, and just having a bit of space is what, when you've got kids especially. Would you want to live there if you could still? I, I don't think so, yeah. man. And I think some of my friends, and this is the funniest thing, some of my friends later in life that didn't grow up there yeah. are like, if I could be anywhere, it'd be Port Melbourne. And yeah. I'm like, I don't know, man. Yeah. Like, is, is are you sure? You know? Yeah, for sure. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's different now. And my family's still there and I go back for Christmas and all that sort of thing. But uh, it's, yeah, I want to have a bit of space, man. Like, yeah. I grew up with no backyard. Like, yeah. not that we did it that tough, but I didn't have a backyard. Yeah. I want to have a backyard, you know, yeah. mini ramp, like a bit of space. For but, sure. You know, yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think uh, we didn't realize that it was unusual to not have that stuff when yeah. we were young. So yeah. I'd like those opportunities for my kid and that sort of thing moving forward. I guess we sort of made up for it, like you said. We like we'd build a skate park on station on Prinny Pier and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Where one thing we definitely took for granted is the public transport that we had. Mm-hmm. Like now, I'm seeing my neighbours and they've got to take their kids. Like taking every once we were like 12 years old, you were independent. You could catch the tram. You're in the city in three minutes. Yeah. You know, like it's like yeah, you could, yeah, exactly. It's, everything was so so close yeah. and so easy. So. Um, yeah, that's one thing that I think we did take for granted back yeah. then. Um, if you – let's go back to the graph thing for a bit. Sure. So, and that crew that you mentioned before, SDM, uh, is – I'm going to say th- there's been some pretty successful people to come out of there sure. from the finding – well, yeah, like yeah. which is pretty pretty amazing when you think about it. So yeah. I, I, I remember seeing a photo the other day with Dabs and Myla, um, and you caught up with them while they are in Melbourne. They've yeah. done some massive – things they super fucking busy man oh man it's uh, it's crazy like your head would spin if you saw their schedule like it's um they deserve all the success they're getting right now like they've been grinding for so long man um probably like 20 years or something like that, you know yeah. what I mean? like um i still remember when i had the last show here down johnson street before they left to go to la you know that was um the last time anyone could afford one of their paintings <laughs> <laughs> i was lucky enough to snap up one but um but yeah, like they they just they're amazing. They just get up and they work, you know. Like uh, if you saw, like sure, everyone see accolades and like be able to like uh, say hey, I'm a famous artist. But like, if you knew what it took to to be that dude, you know, yeah. um, it's a lot of work you know? and a lot of sacrifices as well. Yeah, true. You know, like you probably can't go surfing all the time. You can't hang out with your family all yep. the time. You've got to just knuckle down and yeah. do that. And I think it works for them because they're a yeah. couple, aren't they? Or true, they are. They yeah, are. Yeah. So they, I guess they get their family time sort of when they're doing that sort of thing as well. Well, yeah, they're together. So, I mean, it's not for everyone. I don't think everyone could like work as a husband-wife team. Yeah, man, yeah you know? that's like, very uh, true. Yeah. But yeah, man, they've done some massive things. Like I think they did the whole set for the MTV Movie Awards or something a few something years like that, back. Yep. Like, that's fucking that's yep. huge success yeah. coming, you know, out of sure. just painting walls in Melbourne and doing this. Oh, definitely. So, and I guess it shows you the sort of avenues that yep. the graffiti can open up if you if you stick with it. For and sure. also another another one would be Tom Gerard who's Tom, doing for sure. He's doing uh, people just say like the mullet dudes you know what I mean like, <laughs> yeah. he's, but he's also doing his other thing and he's pretty reputable in that sort of fine art space now as well oh for sure I mean like um, Tom's exactly the same as those dudes he's been there man like the amount of work that guy puts in you know what I mean mm. um, he, and I love his new stuff that he's doing he's almost like our our generation's Howard Arkley in a sense you know yeah, with that airbrush Australia stuff that he's doing stuff. That, yeah you know? it's cool yeah um, so yeah I think Tom's just sort of taken off like he's not even close to where he's going to get to you know yeah um, and he's already so so you know yeah famous and yeah in that respect you know but, huge um, man like people that you don't even know like graffiti would have his artwork in their house now for sure. like because he's crossed over to that sort of thing or they've seen it and like not even known that it was him or whatever him, you know? yeah, yeah which is which is huge yeah and it's really cool for people to to go sort of full circle where they've turned in like you know got into that fine art scene from something that was so not fine art. For sure, yeah. And also Jimmy as well. He's he's oh, out Jimmy. there grinding away, man. <laughs> Jimmy, yeah, he's, he's killing it right now. He's, um, yeah, and that's talk about sacrifice, man. He's away in the country, like, away from his family, like, for months on end, you know what I mean, doing these massive projects. And, you know, if you think painting a train is a, a lot of work, imagine just standing in front of a silo, you know what I mean? You've got yeah, huge, 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 huge canvas, you know, to work with. It's and, crazy. And uh, you, with that sort of stuff, it must be daunting to even think about how you'd even talk about what it's going to be worth, the man hours that would go into it, the amount of paint you'd need. Sure. Like, if you fuck that up, you might cost yourself 20 grand in a commission. Yeah, look, I think he's probably got nailed now, but like, um, I mean, even a scissor lift, lift on one yeah. of those jobs is like in the tens of thousands, man. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, That's just huge. a scissor lift, you know? Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, but I think these councils and it attracts tourism and stuff, and I think that, you know, it's all factored in. You know, they probably get funding from their whole shire or whatever it is, you know, they've factored that in. Mm. You know. Yeah, and it's it's cool, though, because Melbourne is pretty known for its... We, we, it, it becomes a bit cringy because people think of, like, you know, Hosier Lane and, yeah. like, these sort of stuff, which it's kind of cool, and you see a lot of people taking selfies there. But if you go for a walk around Melbourne, you'll see heaps of legal and illegal pieces and there's yeah. heaps of fucking good work out there man yeah. like it's good to just um walk around and see some some other stuff all those people that are doing those tours they should actually like get out of the city a little bit maybe just out into the the fringe suburbs sure. and see some stuff man yeah i think like your prans or your you know your fitzroy's and that sort of stuff all cool. all that, yeah 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 for sure yeah they've got to get out of there man they've got to get out of that sort of because it's just the same shit all the time that they're yeah. looking at in there um you mentioned before painting trains, so we're going to talk about painting trains. Are we allowed yeah. to talk about it? Yeah, well, let's do it. <laughs> Get another one of these. Yeah, let's have another one. I'm getting so. pissed. I'm getting slowly pissed here. Yeah. Jeez, brother. Very slowly. Yeah, very slowly. <laughs> 0.05. Um, cheers, man. Oh, cheers. <laughs> so you've got your crew. Everyone yep. does their own style. Um. For people that don't understand graffiti, I guess they should know that painting on walls, painting on other people's property is a part of it. But I guess the essence of it, what it really comes down to, is painting trains. That's what it's. That's where it sort of comes from. Yeah, that's probably, the, I guess, the pinnacle, you know, painting, getting stuff on a train. And, and the vibe was that, you know, then you've got a your piece going all, all across the city, you know what I mean, whatever mm -hmm. line it is, or, you know, stopping at Flinders Street and then so many people get to see it, you know, yep. rather than like a piece on the wall on the back of like a line where... Yeah, only a select few get to see, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so you want to paint a train. Everyone wants to paint a train. That's the pinnacle. Yeah. So, you think why not? Well, instead of painting a piece on a train, we'll paint the whole train. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the thought process? I guess that's eventually where it, where it ended up. You know, is um, it just keep progressing till you you want to level up? You want to chase a bigger thrill? Yeah, you want to go bigger and better. You start with a panel, you know. You master a panel, then you might go like a door to door. Then like you might start with a window down hole car. Then you might try to do a top to bottom. And then once you start doing all that sort of stuff, then it's like, yeah, like if you do a hole car, you know. Then it's like if you're capable of doing a hole car, well, let's just get like five other dudes, and let's get six carriages, one hole car each, and let's just try go for a whole train, you know. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't know if, it was, if it's ever been done in in Melbourne before. Um, as far as I know, I think we're the first to do it in Melbourne. Uh, That's so what it said on the train anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't it? World's best pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it must be true, man. But um, world's first whole car. Um, so, yeah, I think it is. But uh, some dudes in Sydney, man, they did it. And, like, i got to take my hats off to those dudes because those trains are, like, probably almost twice the size of ours. Because yeah, like, they're, like, those, triple decker ones. Well, the, yeah, double or triple the Tangara ones. Yeah. Um, they're like proper big and i think i saw dudes maybe they only had like four carriages but that's still like massive effort mm -hmm. you know that's huge so props but to them sydney seems to be doing a lot of things graffiti wise now but back then it was melbourne was had a, a stronger scene do you think than sydney did um i want to say yeah like in the 80s and stuff mm -hmm. i reckon it did i mean i wasn't really paying attention to what was going on in sydney back then and um you probably weren't even aware of it like there was no internet, the internet no, yeah. nothing like that you know so you kind of like I only knew what was going on around you, you know what I mean? Like whether it was like, you know, Pran or Dandy or that sort of stuff. And um, and then you saw stuff come from New York, obviously, you know, mm. on TV, movies and stuff like that. And if you got books or whatever, if you're lucky enough to see it or go there, you know, and see it firsthand. Um, so when you're doing these trains and that sort of thing, obviously they're not going to last, so you've got to try and document them. Yeah. Which I guess is such a... It's a, it's a hard scenario for someone who's doing something illegal because you've got a sort of you're keeping evidence on yourself for sure yeah. which is a real like contradictory thing for sure yeah. so you do that you take flicks I guess the pre-internet I guess now with the internet you could put up on the internet it's not it's not your thing but you have to keep old school folders with photos and, and rolls of camera yeah, and that sort sure. of thing it was funny back then because like you're still taking photos on like film you know what I mean mm. and so you you do your piece do your best to try get a photo and then you weren't sure if it was going to come out or not. Yeah. You know I mean? um, and I rarely took photos, man. I was fucking so lazy. Uh, I was just grateful that um, Discreet is mm -hmm. like a filmmaker and stuff like that. So he was really big on documenting things and yep. stuff. Um, and so he would always take photos. Like I 
still probably don't have a proper photo of that whole train we did you know what i mean yeah. and um so yeah that's how bad i was so i didn't have too much for a problem but you're, photos, living, you're but living in the moment a little bit and you're not sure, thinking you know? about all that yeah, sort of stuff and exactly. i guess you're just holding evidence against yourself yeah so inevitably that it comes undone well i guess if you're taking photos you'd probably keep them at other people's houses or something like that maybe mm-hmm. a girlfriend's house or somewhere like you'd have your sort of you know your safety checks in place that sort of limited that sort of risk you know what i mean like mm-hmm. um keeping that stuff sketchbooks or whatever at your house or you know um, which is hard when you just want to be an artist because how do you draw the line between oh, i'm just drawing here and i think every graffiti artist i've ever known if there's a piece of paper or a pen near them they're <laughs> chucking a tag they're doing for a sure, sketch yeah. like that's been near impossible yeah for sure so i guess how it depends how like serious you get into it you know what i mean after that once you start getting like all right i've done a fair bit of damage which i could go down for pretty badly here if um if they were to find something, you start to get a bit more careful about that sort of stuff. And know? more careful with the people you hang out with sure, and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, so you really want to try to keep it to your crew and hope you've done a good sort of, you know, screening process of who you let in your crew, you know. Yep. Um, that's kind of how we got unstuck, I guess, with uh, getting busted with that whole train, you know. We um, were a man short. Actually, we were two men short, but one of the dudes, um, Urge, you know, he's staunch as fuck. He's, he's, like, uh, he's one of the most prolific riders out there, so... Um, yeah, he's rock solid, man. Uh, but yeah, the other dude we let in. Um, yeah, I think the story goes, as far as I know, like uh, we got away with the train. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how. It was mental. Like it was like probably 10 a.m. when we finished painting. Trains are running on the other side of the yard, you know. Oh, yeah. I think the train driver was even tooting his horns. So you could probably <laughs> see vapors coming up over the other side of the train. You know, there's people walking their dogs on the other side of the fucking park, you know, going, oh, you guys are supposed to be in there. We're like, and Trim was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's through the council, man. <laughs> it's for our friends who died and it's uh, it's all good. It's all kosher. Don't worry about it, man, you know. And um, and I just resigned to the fact, man, we're going to get busted doing this, but I've come too far. Yep. I'm just going to fucking do it, get my flick, and get busted for it, and that'll be, that'll be it, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll finish my piece. Sort of got some flicks, and then um, and I'm like still amazed I'm not busted. I'm like, fuck, I'm out of here, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think Benny was like, I'm like, dude, you're going to finish or what? He's like, oh, man. He was on the same same trip, you know. He's like, oh, I'm just probably going to get busted doing this, but I'm, I'm going to finish this piece, you know. And he's like way more intricate than any of ours and that. And, um, and we all got away with it, you know. And then um, I think the dude, the dude who we called in, that ringing, um, I think he was bragging about it to one of his mates and I think one of his mates knew someone or had a mate who lost his job over it because he was like the secchi or something like that there. Bullshit. And he's like, uh, so he's like, oh, he told his mate, hey, you know, fucking you lost your job. Oh, I know the dude too fucking painted it. Saying like, you know, oh, next minute the cops are at his joint, you know, and then like um, they dragged him down and yeah, just rattled us all out, man. Uh, <laughs> that sucks. Like it's yeah. obviously it's a, it's a shit thing to happen. But I guess like any kind of criminal, there's a sense of relief after that. You're like, well, at least I'm not going to get busted for it. Or are you, are you like, or are you just like, oh, you're obviously pissed off. But you're yeah, like, I guess then you are. But when you look back on it, man, like it was like, you no, know, we probably would have done some serious jail time these days in this environment. You know, like yeah. there's graffers going to jail these days, like for, for you know, for criminal for damage, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. you know, um, and just the extent of it, they probably would have made an example out of us. But um, well, it was it was in the it was in the paper and that was, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was in the paper a couple of times in Herald Sun, man. It's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as like the severity, like um, I think I got no conviction, you know. It what was like you, yeah. nothing, man. You know? And then you, I guess you get infamy notoriety out of that, you know, in the scene. People yeah. are obviously going, fuck, man, that's pretty epic. Like even though you got done, they're still commending you for it. You're getting mad respect from people from that. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's that element to it and like you said like the element of relief it's all like all right i've been busted now i can just keep my tag you know and like yep. i can just put that up like um i guess legally now yep. like without any sort of fear of anything so it is it's, it's funny that isn't it like it's kind of puts you into this category where if i'm doing a legal piece that my mates have organized i can put my name up i can take a photo yep. is a sense of relief with that for sure yeah. yeah and that's i guess that is and you're probably getting to the stage where you're getting a bit more mature would you have gone on to paint more trains you know what i mean was that was this kind of like your grand final do you know what i mean like yeah it was like the grand final i think we sort of in that respect probably peaked, shot too high too early <laughs> man you know what i mean in hindsight it would be nice to like 
you know, do 100 more panels or something like that, you know, yeah. and then, then go to that. But then, like you said, everyone's pushing things, so someone else probably would have come along and done that before us. So it was like maybe there was that sense of urgency where, like, oh, no one's done this, and you could sort of see people going that way, you know, trying to push for that something like that big, you know. Yep. And, um, yeah. And it – sorry, man, I'm <laughs> So yeah, you've done that, and then like you've gone to all right. I can start painting legally again. Did did you lose interest in graph for a while after that? Did it leave a bad taste in your mouth, or you just wanted to keep painting, keep doing art, that sort of thing? Um, I think after you've been sort of that high, it'd be like um, you know, to use an analogy of surfing, like after you surfed like a hundred foot wave at Nazare or something like that, mm-hmm. or you know, Laird Hamilton surfing that wave at Chopu. Um, then going back to surfing like two foot fucking slop at like you know mm. in the bay or something like that you know like it's um you know everything's sort of like a bit lackluster after doing something like that so legal walls are cool like painting catching up with mates and having a good laugh and that sort of stuff and it's so relaxed you know there's no fear of anything i guess you know to some degree you uh, you know addicted to that bit of adrenaline you know if you sort of broke it down you mm-hmm. know and that um you know it's exciting you know i guess um but I guess it gives you a chance to actually focus on your art and make it more of a, a full-time gig For sure, rather yeah. than an yeah. illegal passion. Yeah, you know I, mean? I guess every, not every, I shouldn't say that, but like a lot of, you know, people who are artists, who are graffiti artists, then probably want to legitimise them being an artist, you know what I mean? And then, yeah, like you say, they might get bus and go down that avenue, like, you know, Dabs Myler or Tom or whatever, you know. Um, and then, because like, I guess graffiti's not even, maybe now, it's more legitimized as an art form, I guess, you know, but even then, like, everyone's like, they just see it as like vandalism, you know? Mm. And so, I guess if you're an artist, you're trying to legitimize, like, oh, I can also do this, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do fucking paint trains and stuff, but I can draw your portrait or whatever it is. So, like, I want to be considered like an, an actual artist, you know what I mean? Well, that's the thing. I think you, uh, look, <clears throat> I think that you were one of the first people in Melbourne to be doing that sort of 3D stuff to that sort of level. I know there's probably other people that you could mention that For were sure. doing it before that, but you were yep. definitely pushing that 3D stuff, which from my knowledge as someone who was only sort of uh, – was not part of the sort of graph community, uh, saw it happening a lot overseas because that was when the internet started kicking off and you could yep. see this sort of shit and you started doing it here. Were your influencers mostly overseas dudes? Or? Yeah, probably like the German guys, like, you know um – Diam, Lumet, How, Nozam, and all those sort of guys, you yeah. know, um, from over there, you know, that were pushing it over there that I saw them do these letters and I was like, fuck, that's pretty cool. i never seen, like, dudes kind of render, like, tags, you know, without, like, outlines and stuff like that, you know, I guess. Um, and that was, like, cool to see. And I was, I was like, that sort of caught my imagination. And just, like, the – I love, like, shadows and just that play of, like, how you can just create the illusion of a 3D object just with, like, few different colors you know totally and then uh, and that takes you into tattooing as well because the first few tattoos that i got from you we did some photo realism sort of stuff <laughs> yeah which look there's a lot of tattooers out there at the moment that wouldn't even touch that sort of stuff so yeah. that sort of grayscale stuff and that shading kind of thing i guess yeah. your mind works a bit differently to some people your left brain thing and you, and you know that sort of light source stuff really makes sense yeah. to you and that helped you with that sort of tattooing process i guess as well For sure yep and i sort of you know um similar thing happening with the tattooing where dudes are doing tats without outlines you know traditionally they were done like you know big outlines black outlines and that sort of stuff and i guess that's bold and it holds really well you know um that'll stand the test of time where now people are doing stuff it's almost like painting with you know with the tattoo needle you know mm. um almost sort of like oil paintings um and so that's been interesting just to try and master that, I guess, you know. Um, and just, I don't know, it's interesting to see if that stuff will hold up over time. I think it'll be, you'll have to check back in a few years and see how they hold up, you know. It, everything goes through cycles like we were talking about yeah. and there was a black and grey with tattoos and then now it is more of that sort of traditional, you know, and now it's gone even more from the traditional colours to, uh, like you were mentioning earlier, I think maybe off camera, um, that it's solid black sort of prison kind of tattoos now. Yep. So everything just goes through fucking phases. Yeah, phases, that's right, yeah. And they go full circle. Yep. And... Yeah, kids will eventually not like tattoos because all their parents will have all these shit tattoos. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it's like fashionable. They'll probably go out of fashion. It'll be cool not to have them. I'm sure it is cool not to have them as well. <laughs> but like, 
who knows, man? They've already got those. Um, you know, it's almost like a three D printer, but like with a tattoo machine on it. You know, I've seen like a do they really a robot? Yeah, this is like probably even a few years ago. You know, they did like a little thing where only small, but like you can imagine like if they wanted to, they could push that technology where you know I could see it being like a photo booth in a mall where you're going like you. And you ask AI you like, what you want to get. <laughs> probably, man. Yeah, and then they'll just do it for you. Well, they'll probably do it better than all they are. <laughs> Give it enough time, But you won't man. get to talk shit with the person tattooing you. For sure. Though. It won't be for everyone. Like, but There'll be some people who are like, oh, I wouldn't trust a fucking human to do my portrait, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is. I never thought about yeah. that. Now, there's some things that I just want people to actually do. Sure. You know? I think that human factor is like what makes the tattoo cool. You know what I mean? Like it's... And sometimes the tattoo becomes insignificant. You know, you build a relationship with someone. And it's like, like you say, you talk shit. You know, you catch up with someone. It's almost like a therapy session for some people. You know. Yeah, it's like a That's hairdresser. It. Like, there's a bit of gossip going on. Oh, yeah, this is happening. You know what I mean? For sure. You know. But that must be that from I'm only obviously know from the client point of view, but from the artist point of view, sometimes you must be like, "Fuck, this guy's doing my head in." Like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, man. Of course. Like, it's like. You got the whole cross section of people, you know, that you got to deal with, or well, you know, um, not deal with. I shouldn't say it like that, but um, that you're exposed to, you know. And some people are good, some people are bad, some people are better than others. Some people you gel more with, some people you like. I totally disagree with everything that dude said, or whatever. Or yeah, but you've got to be diplomatic, I guess, because yeah, you know. they're a client, and you can't, yeah, yeah. Testing. No one's no one's really that bad, you know. I mean, most people sort of, you know, pretty good in general. You know? And that's the thing; you don't have to book them again if they do your heading. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm book solid for the next seven years, man. That's you right. can't come back. Book's closed. <laughs> the book yeah, the book there is no book anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm retiring. So if people do want to get a tattoo or something now, yeah. where would you uh suggest that they go if they wanted to get a Mickey G tattoo? Uh from me, uh you're probably gonna have to come down and talk here to get one from me these days, man. Yeah. Um you thought about doing some like guest spots or that? That seems to be really like a popular thing at the moment. People jump around from studio to studio doing guest spots and that sort of thing. Yeah, the guest spot. It's a funny thing these days. Um, you used to have to be like, you know, you were been touring for for a long time and had a reputation that sort of stuff. And I guess that's all changed now. I guess the term guest spot is a pretty loose term now. It's like mm-hmm. I'm just going to come hang out with you guys at this shop and and tattoo, you know. Um, and like we are saying, I think off camera, um, off air, there's so many shops popping up now. So like the chance of you knowing someone else or being mates with another tattoo is pretty high. So it's like, yeah, well, when you want to go tattoo with your mate there for a couple of days or whatever, you get to talk shit with your mate. You yep. know? So I think it's, yeah, it's kind of changed what it is these days. You know? And it's only probably possible now with social media that people can do that stuff because back in the day, you'd have to build up your tattoo clientele yeah but now you can just sponsor an ad on instagram and then you're booked out for a week you know what i mean sure. maybe you can tell me how to do that mate <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking shit out of the internet and stuff hey man. no how many likers have you got at the moment <laughs> <laughs> i remember that was a one, one day i was there and you're like oh how many likers have you got and i'm like it's followers you know? <laughs> so the, the, the internet's a funny oh. one man because like you're a, a, a little bit older than me but we grew up with no internet and then all of a sudden it's like you've everyone's got the internet yeah and it's there's email and then all of a sudden the same thing happened to us with social media yeah and now social media's been around like facebook's been around for like 16 years or something now yeah okay it's crazy so it's just bananas and we have I mean, to that's, yeah that's obviously morphed into what it is today you know it, it's Didn't, gone through a few yeah. you know different uh styles and all that sort of thing but I think uh, we just have to learn to deal with it, man. Yeah. I mean, some people, you know, use it really well. I think visually as a tool, like Instagram or Facebook, that's that's really cool. It's like a free sort of advertising, you know. I was pretty late to the Instagram game. Um, I only got it because my mate Pabs was like, man, you got to get on this Instagram stuff, man. I book all my tattoos through there. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I was doing pretty well without it, you know. Mm. Um tattooing in the industrial area no signs or anything like that i was like probably the busiest i would ever, ever been mm. back then so to me like it just seemed like why would i do that you know um and even now i'm pretty lazy with it i rarely post post photos and, or if i do they're fucking the worst photos you know what i mean <laughs> it's like ah snap it maybe more for the clients sort of like just so they but that's nothing because you were saying that earlier you wouldn't take the flicks of the pieces and that sort of thing so it's not for you i think you're more of someone who does it the old school way and then you know yeah. let it naturally play out 
need a PR person to come <laughs> do my stuff. <laughs> sort you out. Yeah. Man, this would have been a few years ago now, but I remember there was an old piece that was at Alma Park, which I yeah. think that, man, it must have been there for, I'm going to say, probably like 15 years. Yeah. And then someone eventually painted over it. And I remember sending you a photo. I'm like, and you and you had a very level-headed, you're like, ah, oh, man, <laughs> stuff doesn't last forever. For sure, yeah. But it's, it's funny because some sort of pieces kind of stay there for so long that they sort of demand respect kind of thing yeah. I wonder how long that you know people don't have to respect if they don't want to For sure. but I guess younger people just paint over them when they feel like it yep. they probably don't understand but do you think if something's been there for like 10 years it's, people should respect it a little bit more probably go around it for sure. Well, I'm pretty upset that the council didn't put that Perspex up there like a Banksy piece <laughs> man, and fucking preserve my shit forever man like so um, I don't know I guess that you know, it's hard when you got new generations coming up. They probably don't know the etiquette or the rules or, like we were saying before, all that stuff goes out the window these days. It's like fucking fuck the rules, you know, some people like that. Um, and the different views between, like, legals and, like, the dudes who are keeping it real, that sort of stuff. And they have, like, they're kind of like, well, fuck this county. He's, he's been um, he's been paid to do this. So, like, and this graffiti man, you know, this is a public domain. I'll paint over it if I want, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, is an interesting one. It was that whole Elmer Park thing. Is like I don't think it's legal, but it sort of is deemed to almost be legal. Yeah, okay. it's one of those ones where I think people paint during the day. Was that the one in the corner there? It was that, on the, on the church, on the back whatever? of the church, I think, back or, of the church. or the back of the. It was a red and blue sort of. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, I think it was like a scout hall type yeah, type of yeah, thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, it's nice that it lasted that long. You it know? lasted a long time, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's cool. I guess what do you do if it didn't? get painted over probably would have got knocked down you know <laughs> some units built there anyway so like what do you you know it's kind of nice that it lasts that long but even like jimmy's piece that massive sdm on in between you the know big block but well that's everyone used to just called the massive blockbuster yeah, yeah yeah so i think that's apartments now or something like that has that been knocked down i think, no, I think what's it's going it's nah, still, i think it's been knocked down bro how wait, I, I would have caught that train maybe about a month ago i reckon I could be wrong. Maybe I dreamt it or something like that, but I think it's it's been... um Really? Yeah, I think uh, someone posted it the other day. Oh, man. Yeah, well, nothing's sacred, is yeah. it? Yeah. Well, I mean, unless you're Banksy, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's which, not. And that to- that whole thing is fucking bullshit, man. Like, you can't have some set of rules for some people and some set for others. Yeah. I don't agree with that at all. Yep. Like, I get that he donates money. He probably doesn't even agree with that. I don't, think, I, mean? I don't think he would. I think yeah. he probably would hate how fucking mainstream all his shit has become yeah. like he's got a fucking a uh, exhibition that has got nothing to do with him like imagine someone who just bought a bunch of your work would ex- like put Exhibit an exhibition yeah, yeah that's not that's not cool that's, either that's pretty weird eh? yeah yeah and that's happened like, and this person too was that like exhibition around of yeah, someone right. else's work yeah. that is not endorsed by them yeah that's I don't know, is that even legal, man? <laughs> what, what if they, someone buys it, I guess they can. And yeah, if he, if he doesn't p- trademark his name, then what's to stop them from saying it's that True. sort of show? Well, it's weird, like, um, when you're putting stuff in the public domain like that, I think that, um, was it Red Scooter wall that I did? Um, someone used that as an as their album cover for, like, um, a music thing. And it's like, it's kind of weird to, on one hand, you're sort of flattered by something like that, but on the other hand, you're like, hang on a sec, that's my fucking artwork, you know? You didn't ask me to do it, but... Mm. You know, at what point, What's where's the boundary between, like, it being yours or a free-for-all if it's in, like, the public sort of, like, um, you know, painting. In the public if you domain. put it out there on the public property or in the public eye, then I guess people can take photos of whatever they want. Yeah. But whether they can use it for commercial gains is different. Yeah, thing. true. Yeah. So anyone can take the photo. I guess it puts in a strange scenario when they put it as their artwork for the album covers. Yeah, yeah. What about when you were growing up and when you really were getting into graffiti, riding the trains, and that's where you see all the stuff? Who were some writers that you really saw and you looked up to and you thought, fuck, I, if I could paint a piece like them, I'd be stoked? Like, who were the early guys that you thought, I'd really like to paint like them? Uh, probably everyone's going to say the same ones that you ask, you know, but um, I mean, Puzzle is probably like on the top of the list Puzzle, Murder. Um, those guys were like, you know, obviously uh, always will be kings, you know. Um, whole WCA crew, that was probably the crew that we sort of, that I sort of thought was, you know. The pinnacle. The pinnacle, man. You know, if they asked you to be in the crew, you're like, oh, fuck, man, I'd, I'd made it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Ranks, you know, he was always pushing pushing the boundaries and stuff like that. Hey, dudes were talking about who, you know, regress their styles or do something totally different, you know. He was really pushing it. Um 
yeah, I know, obviously overseas influences and stuff like that, you know, um, like the 3D sort of stuff. Yeah. Those dudes. Um, I don't know, there's just so many people these days, just all the stuff you're exposed to now, like it's just, there's no like uh, pockets of styles, it's just like the world's so small and everyone's exposed to everything at, at their fingertips, you know what I mean? And like it, it can progress quickly when people can use the internet to see other people's style and all that sort of thing. Yeah. And they can, you know, sort of learn techniques, you know, like yeah. you would... You can see now on Instagram how someone does something where you could have stared sure. at that wall for 15 minutes going, how the fuck did he do that? Yeah, yeah. And even like uh, if it's not Instagram, it's like YouTube, they'll give you a tutorial on how to fucking... There's a tutorial for everything. everything do you know it's, what it's spins awesome. me out? It's got nothing to do with fucking graffiti. Unboxing videos. People watch people <laughs> just take shit out of the box. Is that your son? <laughs> no, he, no. I don't know. Man, I don't know. He watches the iPad and he watches fucking okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But no, people be like, I just bought this fucking whatever and now yeah. I'm about to take it out of the box. Well, that's the other thing with kids, but watching other kids unbox toys and then play with the toys. You're watching them do it rather than play with play yourself. With, and yeah, like, that, that's, that. that's odd. Yeah. But he has, he probably is watching because he's asking me for certain sort of Paw Patrol stuff. I'm like, I don't even know where you get that from. Yeah. He's probably watching some unboxing videos. For sure, yeah. <laughs> Cheeky little bar. <laughs> but that, with, with kids though man look they, these kids are going to be able to do whatever they want to do in any sort of uh, artistic field because of the internet you know like where you would have had to learn how to paint yeah. you know like I, I, I DJ'd I, I, you couldn't there's no YouTube tutorials you know do you think one step further like in a pretty near future do you think it'll go one step further with the Neuralink stuff do you think you'll just fucking oh, here we you'll go. be an expert at everything man you you'll know? be an expert in everything you tap into the matrix you'll just fucking all right I want to be a graffiti I said fucking all right could be <laughs> you know? hey we're going down a path here <laughs> well what do you think mate I think you think that'll that, happen I think that look this AI stuff is pretty scary I think what's happening and how that everybody has uh, a access to it now which so which is fine yep but you could literally type in write me a fucking song yeah it'll do it make me the cover art write me yep. a blurb about my fucking name my, yep. my band whatever we are yep. put it out there now does that mean that you're an artist though yeah, I don't. Know. <laughs> but that's what we're, that's what we're yeah, dealing with now. For sure, and it's probably there's probably heaps of songs um, already written by AI and stuff. The, I think, and apparently there has, of it, you know? there has been, there yeah. has been. Yeah, that's right. And and it, I think it's just getting look. You want the human fucking touch of of any sort of art, I believe. Yeah. You know, like even when something's been printed, it still loses a little bit of its authenticity. What happens when that's better than anyone else who's currently doing something can do it better? Like they can do it better. Like then, what do you do? Do you go with something that's better, or do you go with something that's got? Oh, I like. I would like to know? think that I'm a bit more traditional, and I'd like the original stuff. Sure, like and I think too, most man. people would, but we might be the fucking the odd ones out in a few years' time, where everyone's doing everything perfectly. So, what at what point do you think the tipping scale is where, like, you know, let's say fifty percent of the population has got Neuralink and you don't? You're like, no, nah, I'm not getting it, man. I'm fucking sticking sticking to my guns, man. And I guess. Like, I, I guess so. I guess so, man. I don't do think do? we're we're not gonna we're not gonna live long enough to see things change that drastically. I don't think. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I know that things have changed a lot in our lifetimes. Yep. And I know that they probably will change significantly more. Yeah. But I just hope it doesn't happen, man. I like the real world. Oh, for sure. I, I'm trying to step back and go, go slow and, like, uh, go back to where it was and, like, um, you know, I, I don't need to know everything about everything, you know. It That's was nice. It. Um, Ignorance is bliss. Well, there's that, but it was nice where you didn't know everything and, like, if... You might have a mate who knew something about something, so you'd ring that dude and go, hey, how do you do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was like the beauty of life back then, I guess, you know? I've done that before to a mate. I've gone, oh, how do you do this? He goes, man, just Google it. And I'm like, yeah, but it was a good excuse to talk to you, dude. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you just blown like, that, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Um, no, but yeah, I totally get that. And the yeah. internet, as it has been awesome for a lot of things. Yeah. You, got, I honestly think that the good outweighs the bad. For sure. Um, and it just opens up. Look, it opens up different avenues for people to do things more creatively. It's like any tool. If you use it the right way, it's good. If you use it the wrong way, it's fucking bad. For sure. But I think this AI stuff is getting a bit too... We're not going to... Look, you could just tell it to do... Create you a business and what yeah. you want to do, man. I've seen people do these videos sure. of people do it. Yeah, That's yeah. fucking scary, man. Yeah, I think... I think the level field, the playing field will be leveled. Like if 
if that's at everyone's disposal, you know, and then everyone knows everything about everything. So then everyone's just going to be equal in a sense, you know what I mean? Um, so whether that's, I'm not saying that's a good thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but even the art, have you seen the art generating stuff, how that yeah, works? Yeah, I, I tried it one time. I had this tattoo to do. It was like a Native American thing. And so I just punched in like um, Native American, uh, you know, on a horseback, horse rearing up, black and grey, um, you know, ready for war type of thing, like pretty specific. And it punched out this thing. It was like kind of okay. I wouldn't tattoo it, but like just as like, just just to see what would come out. So I think the way... The horse had six legs that broke. <laughs> really? <laughs> I can show you. It's on my Fuck. computer. Man. But I think funny. the way that people are using it is they're getting really schooled on the code and how to talk to the yeah, thing. Yeah. So you'll go, that's good. At try with four legs. Let's try this angle. And they keep refining it till they get what they want. Sure. Well, and funny. That- I'm punching in chat GPT. Can you give me the winning PowerPoint numbers? What did it say? They said, nah, it's not its expertise. So, like, it doesn't do that, man. Like, oh, but fuck, you, what good are you? You could, you could also say what numbers haven't come out. Like, they, it, it's amazing what they can and can't do. For sure. Do. I mean, you can check that yourself, man. Um, it, like, the Tattersalls gives you, like, the last history of whatever. Yeah. Well, I guess that's all it's doing is refining a Google search and, and yeah. taking the legwork out of it for you. Yeah. I tried it with some trivia questions, and oh, I'm yeah. like, okay, let's see how this goes. And some of them were just wrong. Yeah, right. So, but, but that kind of made me feel good because... Because I'm like, all right, well, it's not going to take over everything because yeah. there's still going to be flaws. Just trivia. <laughs> well, yeah. But what, I, what I'm thinking now is because everyone's using it on this free platform, what they're going to do soon is use all that information to learn more about what people want. Yeah. So they're definitely – it's not free. Like, like, you know, nothing's free. Mm. When when it's free, they're using your, uh, your data or they're learning and all that sure, sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, definitely. So I think that – all of us using it now for this free version we're just guinea pigs and yep. helping it learn more and more about you to take over and kill to take us all. over the world <laughs> take over the world you um, think, do you think that's going to happen I, man I do look I, this is the thing and I tell all those I, movies we make I think they just you know prophecies of what's to come potentially now. look this is the thing man like when we used to I used to get tattooed by you and we'd put all sorts of stuff on the on the computer and watch YouTube stuff and all sorts of things. And I loved my conspiracy shit. Like, I really got into it until it all became a bit too real. And then I'm like, <laughs> fuck, man, this is all a little bit too real now. And then yeah. it, it's, not so, it's not so fun. Yeah. And, and I understand, uh, you know, that you... It, it, for, for, for people like you that kind of... Um, not a, I, I used to like it from an entertainment point of view, and yep. I didn't necessarily bl- read too much into it. Yeah. And then when stuff like what we've been through in the last few years starts to happen, you start to go, fuck, man, like this shit could be real. This yeah. is real. And I guess for someone like you that had that sort of stance, it kind of validates your original thought process a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And um, then, But it's also this whole thing like has sent some people that weren't, going that way they wouldn't have even watched a youtube video on conspiracies for sure all of a sudden it sent them a bit like that <laughs> it's dividing people man uh, what in, what in general mate like uh i think i don't know look i don't i'm i'm of the mindset that if it's a huge conspiracy it's beyond our control yeah i think um i don't know, i think the beauty of the conspiracies is like sometimes it, Stuff's hidden in plain sight, you know, and I think, well, why would they be so blatant about something? Mm-hmm. Surely it's got to be like, it can't be that obvious, you know what I mean? And that's the beauty of hiding something, you know, so like, uh, you know, so huge in plain sight, you know, and then before you know it, it's too late for whatever it is that's it's already happened. And Yeah, I know, man. And I, I, look, I, I, de- we what we've all sort of been through in the last couple of years things have happened and like even now I'll be driving down the street going fuck man I can't believe that actually happened mm. but then you get so accustomed so conditioned to be like this is how it works and we fucking there, there we are I think the other thing is you think oh I'm just so little what could I do to change it man that's, that's definitely yeah. you know like um, you feel powerless to stop this massive machine from sort of going where it's going you know um, but it's interesting did you find that there was a lot of people that just rolled with it that you thought probably wouldn't have 100 percent. it was a massive eye opener you know especially like a lot of quote unquote staunch fucking people that you know claim to be fucking fuck you <laughs> prime example rage against the machine you know yeah. like um having concerts and you had to like uh you know have a like a 
all sorts of parameters just to go to their go to one of their shows or something like that you know what i mean and like they were the original sort of not original but they were definitely very and the poster boys for the middle finger to yeah, the fucking exactly. establishment man yeah you know? and they're like fuck you all right i'll do what you tell, tell me. me yeah exactly <laughs> it's totally. not like fuck you i won't do what you tell me it is yeah and then but that, that that's true and uh, just people personally that i'm like yeah. it, it also sent a lot of people that i didn't pick that were probably i thought more uh conformist to be really like nah fuck this yeah. so i guess you, you learn a lot about a lot of people sure i guess like the worst part was like you know what happened to body autonomy and that sort of stuff you know if we're going down that avenue like um or having someone just whatever whatever aspect of your life it is like some dude in a suit the fucking to tell you what mm. what's best for you you know what i mean like uh whether it's like how far you can drive or you know where you're allowed to go or how long you're allowed to leave your house for like you know yeah you know, people locking people down, you know, not allowed to leave within a 5K radius, you know, things Bananas. like that for like, you know, uh, just, it was crazy, man. Just the amount of people that just rolled over and took it, man. Like people who you thought were, hmm. would be staunch fucking tough dudes, man. Even like, you know, underworld heavies and stuff like that, man. Just, uh, just fucking doing as they're told, man. You know, <laughs> that was... That was disheartening, man. It was really uh, sad to see. I think I think it definitely it, it was, but people felt trapped and felt like they had nowhere to go. And I think that the more that it rolled on, the more people kept thinking, well, we're, we're fucking like, let's just get out of it. Let's just get out of it. And that was, by that stage, it's too late. You know? For sure. Like, what was it? Like the two weeks, just two weeks turned into just two years, you know? Totally. Two, um, two, like two solid years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was like a, it's like a real trip. So bizarre looking back on it, you know. Like it's, it's like a bad dream or something like that. It is, you know? man. It doesn't, didn't even seem real. Sometimes I mean, it feels a little bit like deja vu. Like, like you like, sort of think, oh, did that really happen? Oh, it kind of did. Like it's yeah. a fucking glitch in the matrix or something. For sure, you know. Um, there were, I mean, there were positives to it, like where you got to spend more time with your family, man. That's probably the only positive I sort of took out of it. But um, um, is it the other, the other positive? I think potentially. It was a bit of a circuit breaker for the globe and for the the world to sort of stop emissions and something like that, like to to give the earth a little bit of time to breathe. That was cool, man. Yeah, for sure. When you saw like you know those scenes of like dolphins or whatever in the, in Venice or something like that, was it? You know, I mean, like, it gets. You know, I like think that. pollution probably took a big halt. You yeah. know what I mean? But the thing is that kind of baffles me about the whole thing. And we in Melbourne, we play the not play the victim, but we like to say, well, we're the we got fucking locked down more than anybody. Yeah. But it happened all over the world, like not as long as what we did. Yep. But it was like imagine thinking five years ago that London there'd be no tube fucking trains running and mm. there'd be no cars and everything would be halted. You know what I mean? For sure. I mean, it didn't happen all over the world, like it almost everywhere. But like that was a hard thing where you know you saw us getting so fucking locked down. Then like I got a mate in Texas and he's like at a fucking baseball game. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you think what the fuck, man? You know, like so that was really 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 hard to swallow man you know just being locked down and being told what to do and like you know i had it a bit better than like the people in melbourne you know we were in uh rural victoria you know so i could go for a surf man i could do these things man so i was pretty lucky and um and like you know people here were stuck in our houses like you know you might be I in would, an apartment or i was in, in st kilda man, man like and we had a tiny little space but we would we'd make the most of it yeah for sure but there was people i knew that lived around the corner with like toddlers that couldn't go to the fucking park yeah in a up on the second story of a of a build yeah. of a building with no outdoor area like that's fucking just barbaric. oh for sure and even touch on the park thing man like you know how someone telling like me i can't take my fucking kid to a park man like a, yeah. Man, I took you know, my kids to the park, man. I didn't give yeah. a fuck, man. Do you know, like, St Kilda Skate Park, they dumped sand all at the bottom so no one could yeah, skate well, it. Yeah. Like, you're thinking, okay, if you're outside in your own space exercising, like, and what, uh, uh, that's just, uh, just mind baffling. Like, that's the whole thing, like, none of it makes sense, man. You know what I mean? You got, like, fucking, you got to wear a mask to be able to fucking walk two steps to sit down. Like, the virus can get you here, but can't get you when sitting down. Or you're yeah. safe in bunnies, but you're not safe here. Like, fucking. Yeah. None of it made sense, man. and that's when you sort of start to question, like, this is all fucking bullshit, man. When you got, like, one set of rules for us, like you said, one set for the elites, man. They got parties having all this sort of shit, man, and, and you know, like, they're not getting you know? Mm. So. No, and I think, look, after seeing that the hospitals didn't get overrun like they said they would, and after seeing a lot of things, you'd like to think that the majority of people now are smart enough that they're not going to be, they're not going to roll over that quickly again if something did go down that route. 
Hopefully. <laughs> you, you would, yeah. but fuck, who knows, man? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, fingers crossed nothing like that ever happens again, but, like, you know, I'm sure you see the conspiracies out there that, you know, when you hear, like, these world leaders like Bill Gates or unelected leaders, you know, talking about we got to prepare for the next one, you're like, well, yeah. fucking, what are you talking about? Why would you say that unless you're fucking planning on dropping something else on Totally. Well, they like, say that it's a once-in-a-hundred-year fucking pandemic-type situation, mm-hmm. you know, so... Preparing for the next one should be another fucking 98 years away. Hopefully, you know. Yeah. Now, I look, yeah, the only people that were making money out of it were the, you know, big pharma and all that sort of stuff. Like, totally, I, I get all of that. And it's, the whole thing's fucked. But I just, we, we did, as someone who didn't, I, I did what I'm told to an extent. Mm-hmm. Because, I did, like you said, we feel small and we didn't know what, what to really, what else yeah. can you do, you know? Yeah. And then you'd kind of get victimized if you did go and sort of protest or whatever you were doing. Like it's a, there's really it's a shit sandwich. You know what I mean? Like whichever, whatever way you did it, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then it had families turning on each other because they oh, go, sure. you know, it's yeah. a whole thing, man. It was just a shit. That's, yeah, it's, that's a real thing, man. You know, family members, families torn apart. Mm. Families not even allowed to go. Family members not allowed to go to the functions if they were or weren't fucking. You know, of one. You know. Yeah. Man, you have family members that have missed like the last Christmas with their family. You know what I mean? For like sure. with their grandma or yeah. whatever. Yeah. You know? the people that still aren't welcoming the house because they're still haven't you know it's taken a, a taken of, yeah. an experimental sort of thing. You know? Yeah, it's it's fuck it. It's it's not it's not right. And look, yeah, hopefully we never have to deal with any sort of shit like that again. Yeah. But we've had. I think that look from Melbourne's perspective, we've managed to. It's been a really really hard on a lot of businesses, and some haven't made it. But I think the city in a whole has sort of bounced back as best. It, as we could sure well, I'm glad we sort of brought it back, back around because like man Melbourne really went from being the most livable city like the city I love to being the most unlivable city man like it was really heartbreaking to see what what has happened and where it is now you know it's like it'll kind of never be the same for me you know I, yep. maybe it'll bounce back you know so many businesses and like you know generational businesses just mm. forced to close you know and the, and and the thing is that sucks about that is the businesses that can sustain it are the bigger ones. The That's small right, yeah. ones are the ones that. They're, so they're like, sure. you know, when they say, "Oh fuck, click and collect," you're like, "Yeah, but Office Works can do click and collect, yeah. but that news agency down the street can't do click and collect." Yeah, you know, like that all all that stuff's just bullshit, man. Yeah, and that just strangles the little guy to make way for the big guy. For sure. And if there is going to be a conspiracy at all, that's definitely, I think, probably the the way that it it really could people could foresee that this is the way to do it we need to get rid of all this small business so we've got yeah you know. and that's definitely one of the conspiracies out there you know like that eventually everything will be amazon man you want to cut well, the totally coffee, yeah. a drone will come Trump. and drop your coffee that's to it you, well, that, wherever you are or it did it, it strangled like. small business big time yeah anybody that had overheads and look a lot of luckily you know businesses that didn't have the overheads could sustain you just yeah. you run a circuit breaker for two years yeah but the people that had to keep paying their rent or the people that keep having to pay their staff when their staff couldn't work or you, sure. hospitality businesses, oh, yeah. man, that's like fucking, you're basically, yeah, squeezing the life out of the last few breaths. For sure. Yeah, it was mental. Yeah, it was, um, that's, yeah, like I say, yeah, it's really sad to see what's happening in Melbourne, you know. No, I think Chapel Street, there's probably still a lot of shops empty there or whatever. Um, it, it, it has. Places like that, you know. That's not alone. Man, we used to, because we were living near Chapel Street uh, when that was happening, mm. we'd go for a little walk yeah. in, our, in our allowed area. Yeah. Um, and, man, it was a fucking, like, there was, obviously none of the hospitality businesses are open. Yeah. So that's probably 50% of them. Yeah. All the retail's closed. Yeah. There's just, you know, homeless people sleeping in the street, which there normally would be anyway, but yeah, yeah. it's a lot more, when there's no one around, it was, yeah, there was, the place looked like a, it was, was a year, yeah, yeah. It was, it really the was. the city, man, the CBD was like, man, it's like a ghost town. Um, it was crazy. <laughs> Bananas, man. Hopefully yeah. we never have to see anything like For that sure, again. I really hope so, man. Um, yeah. That was enough, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. That's plenty. Well, let's try not to end it on a somber note, though. I appreciate <laughs> sure, you man. coming in, Mick. Thanks for having a chat with yeah. us. Um, and uh, man, hopefully you'll uh, you'll come back around. And you'll enjoy the city of Melbourne. I mean, it's it's nice driving back here, man. It's uh, still, you know, as bad as it is, really nice to see. I mean, the city's growing. You know, you can mm. see so how much development's going on there. So it probably will bounce back. You know, new life will come back in. People will forget all about what happened hopefully and um 
you know, all the shops will fill up and new life will sprout from all oh, that's all the bad stuff. That's totally. Happening. Well, you know, when there's mad traffic, then the city is is back to for sure. To, to, yeah, yeah. And it still does give me a nice feeling coming driving back in, man. Even being stuck in traffic as much as I hate it, man. It's like, you know, it's sort of nice to be part of. It. It's almost like a flowing, like a just part of Melbourne's sort of thing that it does. You know what I mean? And just being um being in there and being a part of it and tripping out on new buildings that you sort of see you going yeah, coming back in the one next door for sure <laughs> yeah so nah it's, it's nice thanks for having me in, in here man it's oh, been thanks, cool, I appreciate cool to come it. to the big smoke man <laughs> <laughs> thanks man I appreciate it no worries bro thanks dude 3,000 3,000